Good evening. This is Think Tech Global. You are watching Middle East Roundtable. And this evening's show is about what makes ISIS so very dangerous. Uh, to help us with this discussion, we are going to have a counterterrorism expert and former professor at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, Dr. Asan Arari, join us. And we also have a think tech luminary, the CEO of our foundation, Mr. Jay Fidel, uh, who is uh, quite an expert on the Middle East, and we're very pleased to have him join us with this production. Uh, uh, Jay, you're in the studio with us. Thank you, Welcome. David. I'm, I'm really interested in the subject, and I'm interested in what Asan has to say about it. Uh, I think every day goes by uh, shows us that uh, ISIS is more of consequence to us, all of us, than it was the day before. Well, let's go to uh, Dr. Asan Arari uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, Asan, nice to have you with us again, and thank you for taking time in the late evening hours there in Washington to join us here on Think Tech. You're quite welcome. My pleasure. Uh, gentlemen, let's uh, begin this uh, roundtable discussion with uh, kind of the broad overview for our audience as to, to what makes ISIS so very dangerous. And uh, Asan, since you're the expert, I'm going to let you play in the cleanup hitter role and come in after, uh, after we've gotten some, uh, some input from Jay. And you, you fill in uh, some of the areas that he doesn't touch on. But we just, in this, this first short piece, let's just give the audience uh, some, some general background on what, what do you think makes this outfit ISIS, IS, ISIL, whatever they're called. Why do you think they're so j dangerous, Jay? I think the, the whole Middle East has been, what, um, it's been a vacuum. It's, uh, after George Bush went in there and, and destabilized Iran, or rather Iraq, um, and we had, you know, secondary destabilization as a result, in my opinion. See what Asan says about that. I think uh, it left it left a kind of lack of governmental authority, a, a lack of stability, uh, a lack of you know respect for any kind of structure. Nothing you know nothing could be relied on, and uh, I think I think whatever stability was there before was lost in that in that uh, second uh, Iraq war. Well, then you know on top of that, and you and I discussed this uh, before the show. Uh, you have a very interesting phenomenon. You have a lot of uh, Muslim kids in Europe who are disaffected and uh, angry. And, uh, very angry. They, they don't like where they are. You know, the ones in the UK don't like being there. The ones in France don't like being there and so forth. And so this has become a pilgrimage for them to go back and get in trouble. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's wild and crazy. It's anything you want to do. It's the most uh, most adventurous and um, uh, you know un unrestrained holiday you ever had. Go down into the Middle East and get in trouble. And I think uh, ISIS understands this. I think the people who run ISIS Wait, are you are, saying it's kind of like spring break on steroids? Spring break on steroids. You know, with okay. weapons. Okay. Uh, everybody's got a weapon. You know, and that's what's half of the problem. If you took the weapons away, um, you know, it wouldn't be like this. Um, and you know, the other thing is. Um, is that uh, ISIS is very well organized. I think they have learned from Al-Qaeda. They have learned from everything. I mean, if you were sitting writing a book on how to make trouble in the Middle East, you would learn the lessons they've learned and you would use those lessons. And they're going a step further than anybody has gone. They're completely lawless, um, but they're completely organized. And I think they're using the best techniques, uh, the best, for, you know, for them, the best strategies possible. Uh, it's like a, a bad dream come true for them. Wow. And uh, I'm, I'm very impressed, you know, with the way they've taken control of this. And I think that sort of uh, foments, you know, greater violence. I mean, violence perpetuates violence. Violence that, begets again, violence. Begets yeah. violence, thank you. And I think that's what's happened. We're on a kind of negative roll with this, and, and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So how much of that do you agree with, Asan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think by and large, I, I have no, no strong disagreement with anything that you said. Well, all I'm going to say is that, uh, is, uh, that ISIS is, if Al-Qaeda uh, became a movement after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, ISIS became actually the 
the, the peak of that that movement. Now it has become a global movement. It has become a, 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 a regional as well as global movement. We don't know where to start f fighting it, uh, how to start fighting it. That's why I was I was somewhat surprised and dismayed that having after having the best of world's intelligence at his disposal on a daily basis, President Obama said that we don't have a, a, a strategy to deal with ISIS yet. He said, yet is the key phrase. And that, that kind of threw me off and, and CNN was making a big deal out of it by, by playing over and over. But, but the thing is, I can understand why it's hard to deal with ISIS because in, a, in, in the uh, post-Westphalian world where, where national sovereignty became so important, uh, since uh, you know middle of middle of uh, uh, 18th century and so on and so forth, uh, we don't know anything beyond nation is nation state. Right now, right. ISIS comes in, and it, it dismantles the border between between Iraq and Iran, and it says the hell with the uh, Sykes uh, uh, Picard uh, agreement of 1916. We're not going to recognize any any borders. We're going to call it call it, call ourselves first. Uh, ISIS or ISIL, uh, and then it, it, it's just called, calling itself Islamic State. Now it has used a, a very long-standing phrase uh, called caliphate, which was very inchoate, very imprecise word, which has been around, especially in the Muslim world, since uh, you know for the for the for, for the past 1,400 years. And all of a sudden, I, uh, Islamic State became a caliphate, and caliphate became a reality. What, no. well, let's 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 talk about this a little further, uh, Asan, because I think this this notion of the the goal, the drive that uh, it's sort of a given. The, the the regular news media is talking about it all the time. That ISIS's ISIS's drive, ISIS, is that right? Yeah, ISIS. No, it'd be ISIS with an apostrophe after it. Therefore, it's just ISIS. I, okay. The possessive of ISIS is ISIS. <laughs> Asan, I have my, my, my sixth grade English teacher correcting me here on this. But the drive that ISIS has that, that is kind of a, you know, is an assumption as a given in the media is, oh, they're going to establish this multi-nation caliphate that is going to stretch from Iran all the way across the Middle East and pick up the parts of uh, Northern Africa. And so, so for our audience, what is this notion of a caliphate? And I know I'm pronouncing it differently than you are, but but help, help, help me with this. Caliphate was, it's a it's a glamorized version of what it was supposed to be during the days of the prophet. Prophet never called himself a caliph, but uh, the the four gentlemen who succeeded him after his death uh, were, were were caliphs. But that was a caliphate you know, belonged to a very, a very tiny. Uh, uh, city. Uh, from there, it became a world empire when Islamic army uh, started conquering the world, but never called itself caliphate. Now, the notion of caliphate or khilafah, which is the Arabic word, uh, it talks. It, it goes back to 1400 years. It talks about simplicity of the world. It talks about a very, very sim simplified world. It has, it has no room for globalized world. It has no room for compli complications of of contemporary politics. It has. No, no concept of uh, the IT technology yet. ISIS has become a champion of the use of IT technology. It has become uh, the champion user of uh, a, a social, a social revolution. Uh, you know, uh, you know, YouTube and so on and so forth to to popularize or to to propagate it. It's gruesome uh, way of dealing in, with. In with fact, they ISIS. have. ISIS, in fact, ISIS has really got this social media propaganda thing down right uh, r right at the ultimate cutting edge of uh, our younger generations here in the United States. I mean, the, the ISIS knows how to use the Facebook and Twitter and, and, uh, and YouTube, as you say, and that gives their, their propaganda arm a lot of firepower. Well, let's, let's look at the four corners of what we have here. Social media, they're young, they're plugged in, some of them, maybe the leaders have been trained in this country, actually. Uh, maybe. maybe. I, you know, we don't know who they are, uh, I don't think. Um, and then, you know, the, the caliphate thing, what's scary about the caliphate thing is they don't recognize borders, like uh, Asan said a minute ago. They don't, there are no borders, which makes it easy if you want to just run roughshod over the whole region. You don't care about borders. This is a really interesting and strategical sort of defining point for them. All right, hold that thought. Hold that thought, Jay. 
uh, let me talk to our producer for a second. Let's show our audience uh, on this point that Jay is talking about, the territory that ISIS had captured um, by June of this, this year. That would be number, visual number nine, if we could. Uh, number nine. Uh, it's a map. There we go. Uh, and so what, what you see there, ladies and gentlemen, from this map is in June this summer, uh, you see that Baghdad, as of June, was in the clear, and those areas that are pink or red are ISIS-controlled. And now let's go to number 12. Let's go two months later. Look at the difference now. This is number, we're, we're going to go to number, oops, I'm sorry, my mistake. Let's go to number 10, if we could. There we go. Sorry. And uh, you notice that, that the tentacles of ISIS are reaching out to, up to the borders of Turkey, into Lebanon, uh, uh, to the borders of Jordan. And then look way to the south, right near the ThinkTech logo there, ladies and gentlemen. You'll see the city of Baghdad almost surrounded. Uh, and depending on how you read this, nearly surrounded. And this goes to your point, Jay, of the, the, just the, the national borders don't mean anything. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when you start looking at the defining points of this organization, you begin getting scared because they're so damn smart. These guys uh, have worked it out. Uh, this not limited to a bunch of hooligans in the desert. These guys know exactly what they're doing. And I'm not sure it's internal or it's external. Who knows what kind of advice and consultation they're getting? Who knows exactly what weapons they're getting? Um, but, but it's impressive. Anyway, so you go across the border. You don't care about borders. You terrorize other nations. It gives you leverage, doesn't it? It makes you, you know, that much more imposing and maybe capable of negotiating extraordinary things. And, and I guess you do that, another defining point, is by striking fear into the heart of everyone around you, including nations, but also especially people. I mean, cutting off the finger of the guy who votes, really? That's really out of pre-Stone Age. Um, and, uh, you know, killing people because they don't want to convert to your religion? Uh, that's ridiculous. And chasing women and children up a mountainside, um, making, you know, effectively trying to kill them. Uh, I mean, what they're doing is the ultimate in terrorism. Let me show you a picture, Jay, and I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a uh, picture. here. Let's look at number three for a second here. This is a, a level of uh, number three, child crucifixion is what we want to look at. There we go. Not a pretty picture, ladies and gentlemen, and this is precisely what, Jay, you've been talking about. Uh, these guys have, uh, you know, they have ethics and morals that I'm not so sure even existed 2,000 years ago. You know, at, at the time of the uh, crucifixion that we know of, uh, no one would well, think of doing this to a the brutality to a children and well, the beheading. Brutality in this, in this context, to me, it's more than just brutality. And for that matter, it's more than just terrorism. It is a strategy. It is a defining point. It is, uh, what do you want to call it, kind of a PR thing where you define yourself to the world and thus also out of this you get more leverage, political leverage, military leverage, psychological leverage over everybody in sight. These guys know what they're doing. It's almost like, you know, it's, it's inconsequential about exactly how brutal it is, but it's brutal enough to give them a consequence they want. All right, on that note, we're going to take a break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back uh, after the break here, and we're going to talk further with uh, 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 Dr. Asan uh, Arari in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, Mr. J. Fidel on what is it that makes this ISIS so very, very dangerous. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break. Hi, I'm Donna Blank. Okay, Asan, how much of that do you agree with? Well, on that... Wait, 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 wait. wait. Hold Two to three Hawaii time. I would really love to have you watch the show and see what we do here. I talk with some of the most amazing people, artists, most of them, all of them involved in some sort of artistic process. And our goal here on the show is to dig into that artistic process, and you would not believe what some people say, what some people do, what people go through to express. And these are people who 
have to express somehow, and I find that infinitely interesting. Not only that they have to express, but how they end up doing it. I really hope that you will watch the show and enjoy talking with some of these people the same way that I do. Thanks, and I hope to see you soon on Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series, Wednesdays from 2 to 3. See you soon. Back. This is Middle East Roundtable, a Think Tech global production. And our topic uh, that we're talking about this evening is what makes ISIS so very dangerous. Our special guests uh, with me in the studio, Mr. Jay Fidel, the CEO and founder of Think Tech, uh, and uh, with us uh, on uh, via Skype from Washington, D.C. is Dr. Asan Arari, a counterterrorism expert and former professor of this topic at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies here in Hawaii. Um, Jay, you had a question you wanted to put to Asan. Uh, yeah, Asan. so I mean, we're just looking at these defining points and trying to sort of get characteristics that are unique about this group. Um, but when you take, I mean, and we haven't finished, but when you take a look at the ones we've talked about, you know, namely the geographical maneuvering, you know, and the taking of territory, uh, and uh, you know the, the social media and the high tech, in, and uh, and this extraordinary level of violence and what do you want to call it, uh, being really really mean to people. Um, I mean, I, one thought, by the way, I get on that is that that was what Hitler did, and it, it couldn't last. It couldn't last if you disaffect your own people. Uh, it, it, for a while, you can put them down, but after a while, they'll rise up. Yeah, but the thing I wanted to ask uh, Asen is this. Looking at that map, considering these, uh, what do you call it, strategical uh, persona points, what do they want? What are they doing? Is it just taking territory? It can't be religion. Um, what, what's, what, the, what are they about? What do they really want to do? Great question. Well, they, they want to establish, uh, they, want, they really, they, in their mind, uh, it's possible to globalize the caliphate. Uh, what they have achieved is, a, is an impossible task, and they have achieved, they, they made, a, they made a fun out of the entire notion of nation states. Uh, they have made fun out of the great powers' uh, capability to do something to, to stop them. And thus far, they have succeeded. So thus they have become, ISIS has become more courageous about what, what they can achieve. But extended, now, one, extended one degree further, Asan, what do they want? They, you know, it looks like a virus or a cancer, that, that map you showed, David. Well, uh, uh, yeah. They want to control that whole area? They want it to be all red? Well, they, uh, yeah, they, they want, they, okay, they, uh, they, they want to take over Iraq, uh, eventually perhaps conquer Iran, uh, the lowest hanging fruit, uh, is, is, is Syria uh, in, in the you know in, in the west you have uh, in the east you have uh, uh, you have uh, Jordan you have Lebanon uh, terrorizing the whole area destabilizing the whole area the more chaos they create at least according to their own thinking the the better are the chances of of uh, even even acquiring the ability to to terrorize and destabilize Israel so. What they have, what they're doing right now, they have a strategy. The strategy is to uh, target the near enemy. The near enemy is the state of Iraq right now. The near enemy is the state of, 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 of uh, Syria right now. The far enemy is the United States. See, there's a, there's a great difference between what uh, Osama bin Laden tried to do in 9-11. In, in 9-11, in they came after the, 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 uh, the far enemy, the United States. In, in 2013, 2014, ISIS has an entirely different goal. The, the goal is to target the near enemy. So now, what it, has so happened? What, so let, what, me so just, let, me just, let me just finish this, okay. this thought. Uh, what has happened, they became successful in targeting the real enemy in the aftermath of the, of the so called Arab Awakening or Arab Spring. Because Arab Spring, Spring has, has destabilized Libya, destabilized Egypt destabilized uh, Tunisia uh, and destabilized Syria. So destabilization has become uh, much easier for ISIS. Yeah, and, and it, it's not something that, they, that they're responsible for, but they exploited it. So thus they are in the process of, 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 of targeting the near enemy. And uh, they, I mean, they don't have a, like, a, like a timeline. They don't have objective number one or two or three, like in the military sense, but they are targeting the near enemy. And we are, nobody's coming to the rescue of Iraq. The United States wants one Muslim country to come to the rescue. Nobody wants to do that. 
So United States is left to, to fend for itself or, or, or to, to defend Iraq. If we, of all the countries in the world, the countries which has helped us is Iran in, in, in Iraq uh, by, 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 by endorsing uh, Haider al-Badi, uh, you know, the new prime minister. Uh, without, without Iranian endorsement, that guy would not have become uh, prime minister. Uh, he was Iran's choice first, it, then he became uh, United States choice. So, uh, so ISIS has become powerful because there is so much chaos. The more chaos there is, the more the more powerful they're likely to be. But you see, we have a we have a real major dilemma. United States major dilemma is we don't have a strategy. Our strategy would would, would require ground uh, commitment of ground troops, which is an extremely unpopular uh, notion in, inside the United States. Uh, what what we need to to do, we must do, is do nation building in in, in Syria, nation building in in, in uh, Iraq, which the entire notion of nation building has become a four letter word inside the United States. We don't have the economic power anymore, and we have absolutely we are we're in no mood. We don't have the power. We don't have the capacity to do nation building. Thus, thus uh, we are encountered with, with the kind of dilemma that President Obama is encountered with. What to do with IS, ISIS? Well, you know, in listening to, to, to your explanation, Asan, one of the things that has occurred to me is that because we have no strategy, at least that was the statement coming out of the White House today, and because a strategy, a key strategy, would be some kind of nation building, those, those two factors are, in fact, serious multipliers of the danger that ISIS poses because they make the situation that much worse. In other words, the fact that the, the, the fact that the United States is not in a position to come in, has no strategy, and doesn't want to do that, and yet that is, there's a need for some kind of nation building according to what you've said, uh, it, it, no, the first it strategy, elevates the, the firepower and the danger of ISIS it seems to me. Right. Yeah, the first strategy, you know, you know, in order for us to be effective, the first step has to be defeating the ISIS, and and we cannot defeat ISIS by 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 merely using air power. There's no way in the world we're going to do that, because air power has to has to be, uh, you know, even even under the best best possible intelligence uh, awareness, uh, our performance is going to be spotty and and sketchy. Uh, without uh, ground troop co commitment, we cannot achieve that. The second strategy is to is to come up with what is the alternative for ISIS. What are we ready to achieve in in Iraq? I mean, in in Syria. In Iraq, of course, we want we want the continuation of the government and, and continued unification of Iraq, which is com com comparatively simpler. When you take a look at Syria, do we want to fight Bashar al-Assad, who is also fighting ISIS? Or we are going to help Bashar al-Assad fight uh, ISIS and defeat it, and thus, in the process, we emerge as the number one supporter of Bashar al-Assad, who has butchered over 200,000 uh, his own civilians, uh, mainly by, by by use of chemical weapons and so on and so forth. Okay. That's so what I call the, destabilization. Yeah. You know, I mean, where do you go now? Well, I think there's one other one other complication that that uh, or layer of complexity that we need to. To, to, to lay over this problem. And let, let me ask the producer, uh, let's, let's show uh, um, the uh, uh, visuals number 11 and 12, if we could. And Asan, let me go to you on this. We're going to show the audience uh, 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 this whole notion of the, the Sunnis versus the Shias. And, uh, and maybe you could explain to the audience uh, the, the that there is a serious division amongst the Islamic uh, uh, sects or countries uh, in uh, in the Middle East. Well, this, the the difference between Sunnis and Shias has, has been around since the days uh, of the death of death of the Prophet, uh, but those those differences were not as intense as they have become in, in the recent past. How intense now, are they today? They are, they are, they are quite intense right now. But you have to go from country to country. In in Pakistan, they're very intense. They're in Iraq, they're very intense. In Lebanon, they're very intense. Uh, well, hey, it's on, it's on. Hold on. What does very intense mean to you? Very intense means you have a, a near near civil war situation. You have a, a bomb explosions, killing of a, a large number of people on a daily basis in all the countries that I have mentioned. Uh, 
it's, it's called the, you know the, the the sectarianization of the conflict that is Shia and Sunnis have lived uh, side by side as neighbors as friends um, you know uh, uh, and and they, they inter intermarried yet the tensions were there always but you see since this is kind of a very embarrassing thing for, for, for me to mention the one of the countries which is which is largely responsible for intensification of Sunni Shia hatred is Saudi Arabia. Their Wahhabist uh, ideology has declared Shias as infidels. This is the Wahhabist. Infidel Wahhabi. is an unbeliever. Wait, say, say again slowly, Asan. I didn't hear you clearly. You were saying that the, Saudi Arabia has been a country that has fomented this uh, Sunni Shia uh, uh, animosity. Because animosity of, through, the, through, through the ideology of uh, Wahhabism, or it is the ideology of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, a, 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 an Islamic uh, cleric of uh, the 18th century. Uh, okay. He signed a pact with the government of Saudi Arabia on the basis of which Saudi government agreed to promote his credo, his ideology, uh, which is which revolves around jihad, uh, which uh, revolves around takfirism, which means condemnation of anybody whom they think is a Muslim or not a Muslim. Like 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 in Islam says, you're not supposed to judge you know, to judge any person's religiosity. Only God has the right to do that. Wahhabists, Wahhabis, Wahhabi, Wahhabis, or believers in Wahhabist ideology, they are constantly judging. Anybody who does not follow their version of ideology, the, he or she is not, not even considered a Muslim. So, wait, 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 slow down now. So, so what you're saying is that the Sunnis look down their nose so much at the Shiites that they don't even consider the Shiites as as Islamists, they consider them as as infidels, right? Infidel, yeah, yeah. And the reverse is true. The Shiites look down their nose at the Sunnis to the point well, that... Well, yeah. Hatred, hatred begets hatred, sure. All right, yeah. now let me go to Iran for a second. Iran has fomented and developed this Shiite group called Hezbollah, yes? Yeah. And Hezbollah has developed a, uh, or an offspring of Hezbollah is the group Hamas, yes? No, 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 no. Hamas is not the, not the offspring of Hezbollah. Hamas is, if anything, it resembles Islamic Brotherhood, Islamic Brotherhood of Egypt, that they have the same ideology. Okay, is that Sunni or Shia? Is, no, so Hamas is a, is a Sunni organization. Oh, Hezbollah okay. is, a Shia, is a predominantly Shia organization. Its headquarters are in Lebanon. That's where its, its main power base is. It is a paramilitary organization, and it has also emerged as a powerful political organization uh, since uh, late 19, well, mid to, mid to late 1980s. David, when we come back, uh, can you explore with, uh, with Asan and me um, exactly how the religious angle plays into what ISIS is doing? I mean, I, I see it as cold and hard, a part of their, you know, uh, uh, their definition, defining points, um, but they are using all of this. They are using it as an opportunistic um, problem in the Middle East, and uh, I'd like to hear exactly what their MO is. In other words, they're in place A, they go to place B, they take advantage of the Sunni Shia, Shia kind of uh, you know, animosity, like, okay. uh, and somehow they parlay that into control of the area. And then I'd like to also ask, you know, when they've done that, what's the end product? What, what, you know, if, they, if that whole map turned red, who would be running the place? Asan, you've got uh, uh, some, some, some serious thinking to do over the commercial break, and we'll be back to you in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. What makes ISIS so very dangerous? We're going to find out more when we come back after the break. Stay with us. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asia in Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Bye. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. We're back 
This is the Middle East Roundtable. I'm your host, David Day, and we have uh, on this program a, 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 a smoker of a topic. We're, we're discussing what makes ISIS so very dangerous, and helping us do that is Dr. Asan uh, Arari, a uh, uh, counterterrorism expert uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, and a man who's, uh, whose time has certainly come uh, now. And also with us in the studio is Mr. Jay Fidel, the CEO and founder of Think Tech, uh, quite an expert on the Middle East, if those of you who've been watching this program uh, uh, are sure to find out. Now, right at the break, if you just joined us, uh, uh, Jay put a uh, multi-paragraph question to Asan. <laughs> and for those of you who just joined us, I'm going to ask Jay to, to uh, g just repeat the short version, because the long version uh, Asan has in mind. And the question has to do with the impact of this Sunni Shia splinter in the Muslim world and what it has to do with ISIS. Yeah, I mean, it actually falls right into the thing about uh, uh, the, the caliphate, because there's no boundaries. And this, this problem between the Sunni and the Shia uh, exists all over right. in many countries. And so it seems to me, I mean, I'm looking at it really cold and hard, what strategies are involved. And uh, let's assume they're not really in this for religion. They're in this for territory or power. Uh, or wealth. Or wealth, yeah, it comes with the, the other thing. So <clears throat> my question to you is, uh, where does religion play in this? How do they use religion when taking over territory? When they come into a town and they want to do their thing, you know, their MO, how does religion play in that? And the, and the second part, of it, if you don't mind, is once they go through their little steps of well, sort of territorialization of a given area, uh, what, are they, what are they going to do with it? Do they make a government? Do they put somebody in charge? Have we seen enough to know the answer? If the whole map turned red, who'd be running the place? You know, if we were, this was in a, in a court, I'd have to object on the basis that that was a compound question. But, uh, <laughs> that's, but that's my style, David. I, I'm sorry. I know, it's good. You can hey, answer son. any part of that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Asan, hey, have at it. This is uh, because well, I know most, our viewers are very interested in this. The, the modus operandi of ISIS is very simple. They, all they want to write right now is territorial expansion and uh, uh, creating, creating loopholes and exploiting loopholes. And, and uh, uh, what, uh, what has crammed their style is the U.S. United States use of Air Force has slowed them down a little bit. Now, they're, they're, they're hoping that they would make some successful, some, some, some spectacular gains inside Syria and use that as a, as a basis to uh, move toward Jordan and move toward, toward, toward Lebanon. But our challenge is, is to how to nullify their gains. That's where the U.S. use, use of air, air, air Force comes in handy. That's where the U.S. Uh, use of uh, special operations comes in handy. Uh, you know, I mean, especially looking at from the perspective of PACOM, of course, that's not uh, part of PACOM's AOR, but CENTCOM and PACOM, and they kind of intermingle in terms of their, their, their area of uh, responsibilities, and especially kind of in terms of counterterrorism. They have to take it. They have to pay a lot of attention to the fact that that ISIS has become a very powerful ideology. The ideology is being anti-Western. The ideology be, being uh, this this overthrowing the notion uh, of uh, nation-state, national sovereignty. But it's not religious, and, is it? What I'm sorry. It's not religious. No, religion. Religion becomes a useful tool. Yes. There you go. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's a useful tool. Uh, there is an awful lot of resentment among Sunnis of Iraq. Uh, in the days of uh, Saddam Hussein, they were in the they were in the minority, yet they controlled the, the government. Yeah, in, the, in the in the in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion, the, today's Iraqi government is dominated by the Shias, and Sunnis have stayed from power. So every single Sunni resents the United States. Every single Sunni resents the U.S. established uh, order. So every single Sunni of, 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 of uh, Iraq supports ISS. You see, that's, this is where their, their support is coming from. Uh, but they, in turn, have been so strict in terms of imposing Sharia law, in terms of imposing religious laws, uh, they are not very smart in terms of, in terms of how, to, how to capture the allegiance. Now, what's happening since the since since the um, uh, replacement of the Iraqi prime minister, the new prime minister is hoping. We are hoping. Everybody else is hoping. Sunnis of Iraq are hoping that he'll be able to establish a consensus government comprising Sunnis, Shias, 
and uh, Kurds and so on and so forth in Iraq, and thereby uh, undermining the support for ISIS. Well, first of all, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen anytime soon. Number two, if that were to happen, uh, we're not going to see any, any immediate effect on uh, uh, undermining the, the, the power of ISIS, the influence of ISIS. ISIS is being very, very smart. You know, they are, they are, they know where their 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 weakness is. They know their their future is dim when it comes to to, to creating a, a global uh, caliphate. But as long as the caliphate lasts, it becomes a very powerful president precedent for for future uh, terrorist organizations to say, look, look where Al Qaeda came from. Al Qaeda came from nowhere. And it succeeded. I'm, I'm, I'm describing the world from ISIS's perspective for you. Right, right. Go ahead. And they attacked the United States, the, the, the most powerful country in the world. They attacked our Pentagon. They attacked our, our Wall Street. They even wanted to attack our White House and, and, and Congress. Uh, God, thank God they, they, they did not succeed. Compare that to ISIS and how much tremendous of an achievement they have, they have made by, by, by destroying uh, the borders between between Syria and, and, and Iraq, and by capturing a, big, a large chunk of, of territory. Now, if the United States were to fail in, in coming up with a military response, I will pretty much, pretty well guarantee you that ISIS will, will confront the Kurds. And if Kurds were to go, then it'll be uh, ISIS fighting against Iran. And that's 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 going to be a pretty pretty bloody battle because Iran is already fighting with ISIS in Syria, Iran is ready to fight ISIS in in, uh, in Iraq, but Iran does not want to do it because uh, it's, it's it's too close to home. I ask one and it's hoping that, that the United States would help will will come to some sort of a rescue of, of for both Iraq and and uh, Asan, Kurds. I'm gonna I'm gonna interpose a question here just just on the basis of time because I want to make sure you have enough time to answer the question. Uh, as perhaps the or one of the very senior experts in the United States on counterterrorism, uh, and given the fact that our president today has made a statement that the United States has no strategy yet uh, in place on how to deal with ISIS, it occurs to me that you might just get the call from the White House. And uh, uh, without giving away any kind of uh, confidentiality or uh, uh, state secrets, if you will, uh, I wondered if you could, uh, in, in general terms, what, what, what would your advice be? Well, I think we need, to, we need to establish some sort of a consensus. We need to follow George Herbert Walker Bush's strategy of, of a, of a uh, globalized or international coalition to, to fight uh, to, uh, to reestablish statehood of Iraq, uh, we have to uh, have use the same same coalition uh, to bring about order in in, in Syria um, by defeating uh, both Assad, Bashar Assad and ISIS. Uh, I think United States has the credibility to do that. United States has the economic wherewithal to do that, and more importantly, United States has the the, the, the military brain. American military personnel are, are some of the best in the world in terms of their original thinking, in terms of their in, term, in, term, in terms of their capacity to to come up with sui generis uh, fighting strategies. And as fighting long strategies. as they are not interfered with politically, I would agree well, with you. That will that, that will that, that will never stop so because because we have civilian supremacy. I uh, that is a given. That is a constitutional supremacy of, of, of this. Of, but you know, uh, we have an example of Abraham Lincoln. We have an example of, 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 of uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. We have an example of, of uh, George W. Bush, and of course, Obama, Obama did not do too badly. Uh, of course, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I think in a lot of ways I'm quite uh, pleased with with the with the moderate handling of President Obama's uh, Middle Eastern policy. But uh, well, wait a minute. Let's be clear on this. That let's be clear on this, uh, Asan. That's your view, and uh, you and I are you. You and I know each other, and uh, but but I will tell you, I disagree with you. I think uh, Obama's handling of the Middle East strategy has been a disaster, but that's that's between. <laughs> but but great minds can differ on that. Yeah, I, I I understand that. What I'm saying is that that the United States has the reputation as a great power to come up with 
some sort of a model to fight ISIS, uh, both ideologically, both uh, in terms of hearts and minds, both in terms of military strategy. Uh, but you know, you know, when we, we started early on, Asan, you you said you made the point that it was not a good idea to do boots on the ground, uh, and that and and that um, you know we have to do boots on the ground in order to make any real headway because uh, air attacks really wouldn't work with them. And, well, and I think, I think um, you know, that's sort of, that is a main thread in all of this. You know, if David asks you, what would you advise the president? You're going to be reluctant to advise the president to put boots on the ground. And your no, advice no, no, that he should follow... Well, that is the word boot, boots on the ground uh, as part of my advice. First of all, I will not be, be too generous about advising the president. Far be it for me to, to, to be an advisor to the president. But I, but knowing President Obama, I think he could he could operate on the basis of division of labor. That's why I'm talking about a global coalition, whereby you know the Arab forces can be used on the ground. If you were France uh, or Germany, can, if you were France or Germany, would you help put boots on the ground? They've been through Arab, that Arab already. Arab they had a, they had a bad time. Uh, do they trust us in order to send troops there again? And once you send troops, say for example, into Syria. Uh, and with, uh, especially with these ISIS guys, there's tremendous possibilities for them. All they got to do is catch one, and catch one live one, and behead them. And behead them. And you're going and all the, you know, the French and the Germans are going to say, "Oh, not us. We're not going there." So I mean, putting a George Walker Bush thing together, putting boots on the ground alone, neither of those is really very appealing. And so the question is, what's left? Is there a viable option to deal with these guys? That is my option. I just described it to you. And you, you didn't even let me finish it, flush it out before you dismissed it. On the basis of division of labor, the United States can, can, can play an effective role in, for instance, bringing Iran uh, in the fight. Uh, you know, Iran has a tremendous number of ground troops in Iraq already. Uh, who, who can stabilize, who can help stabilize Iraq. Iran, Iran has a tremendous number of forces in Syria. Right now they are, they are supporting uh, Bashar al-Assad. But, but under, under extreme circumstances, I can, I can envision a scenario whereby, uh, whereby uh, uh, Iranian forces may be used uh, to, to, do, to stabilize Syria, uh, you know, f to, to emerge as is this is a stable major Arab, Arab state uh, it's, it's going to take a lot of doing uh, I'm not sure whether President Obama has has time left in, in the office to do that but at least he can have a major start because right now everybody in Washington DC is just just rubbing their hands okay what to do now what to do now we're all lost we're all lost well you know but somebody has to do some critical thinking in terms of coming up with some sort some sort of a some sort of a, 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 a blueprint and uh, uh, George Herbert Walker, Walker right. Bush's plan comes. We're through. out of time, Asan, unfortunately, and uh, I want to I want to thank you for this uh, sparkling conversation. Uh, uh, tremendous uh, amount of material that we covered. Thank you, Jay, and ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned a lot. You've been watching a Think Tech Global program. This is one of our new Middle East Roundtable series. We'll have more in the weeks and months to come, and. Uh, uh, thank you both for participating, and Asan, we'll have you again. It's great to see you. Thank you, Asan. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you very much. Nice to see you both. Bye -bye. All right. Good night.